Well, this is a real thrill today. We've got another special guest today joining uh, our usual suspects, uh, Lance Roberts, Gary Jeffries, and myself, Randy Steinman. And we have Scott Driscoll here today. And Scott, most well known for a, a 28-year career as a linesman in the National Hockey League, but uh, he also played hockey, was a, a OUA champion at Laurier. He coached Guelph uh, women's hockey for a few years. And uh, Scott, great to have you. I guess the first question would be the, the highlight of your career or the low light of your career would be doing a few games with Lance Roberts. Well, yeah, I, I didn't want to say it, but uh, but you did it. No, uh, Lance was a great man. Uh, we had a lot of fun uh, working together. Lance and I were... Uh, we worked the the finals of the American Hockey League in the ninety one or ninety two ninety three season, and then we were both hired full time to the NHL shortly after that. And uh, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, Lance got us. Uh, we are banned from a bar called Smooth Herman's in Cape Breton mm-hmm. during that American Hockey League championship. But uh, that's a long story, and I don't think we have enough time to, to go into it. <laughs> yeah, that was quite. That was a good. That was a great series, actually. That uh, Rochester and uh, Cape Breton. That was a. That was a highlight of that game. That last game was was quite a. Well, it was my last game in American Hockey League, just like yourself. Yeah, did a lot of games together in American Hockey League. That's for sure, Scott. Yeah, we. You know, you you carried me, Lance. I don't know if your back's still sore from the chair, <laughs> but it was it was good. No, I didn't carry you. You you did you you, you did your job every night for sure. <laughs> hey, Scott. So I'm curious. You grew up in Seaforth, played minor hockey, obviously, mm-hmm. because you played hockey at, at Laurier. Um, and then you played, I believe you played for a team that won an OUA championship. Am I right? What do you remember most about that? Well, um, I, I remember just, if it's, there's so many memories. Uh, the one memory is that, uh, the night you won the Ontario championships, uh, March the 10th, 1990, I, uh, ended up meeting a very, uh, beautiful young lady that night that was a basketball player that maybe played for coach Jeff. Yes, she did. And, uh, you know, that's my, that's the highlight. Uh, we won the championship, but I'm at Colleen and we end up, uh, getting married <clears throat> a couple years later. Um, sadly, uh, I, I, it was such a great team and a great group of guys, but one of our, uh, teammates, uh, probably the, the glue that held the team together just passed away a couple of days ago here in Guelph, Dave Burke. So as you, uh, bring that up, I'm just kind of flooded with, uh, the emotions of, uh, of losing Berkey at, uh, in the prime of his life. What do you remember about that team, Gary? Well, that, uh, that was a heck of a hockey team, uh, for sure. Uh, they, uh, they certainly could play and, and, uh, I don't think I missed a whole lot of games. Um, I remember, uh, guys like, uh, Mike Maurice, uh, the chief, uh, Pawalski, uh, Mark Lyons, uh, Robbie Dobson was your goaltender, I believe. Um, well, one one guy I wanted to ask you about, though, and, and uh, just to see if if you ever would have thought back in the day that uh, that Steve Griggs uh, would would end up. Uh, I believe he's uh, he, is he a president or the uh, whatever with the, the Tampa Bay Lightning. I, I know he's got a a big role down there. Did did you ever see that coming? I don't think any of us did, but uh, he was a very uh, entrepreneurial, uh, hardworking gentleman. Um, on the ice, he was uh, he was just a pain in the butt to the other team. He just you know went hard all the time and uh, tenacious four checker. And uh, yeah, no, I was able to to meet up with Griggsy a few times over the years, and uh, I have a, a great picture I just shared because Griggsy was really really close with Dave Burke and. Um, I showed a picture of uh, the three of us back in 2019 after a game in Tampa and uh, sent that to, to Griggsy yesterday. But no, uh, you know, I'm I'm happy for his success. Uh, when he had the, the opportunity to have the Stanley Cup for a day, he invited the whole team up to a golf course. And, uh, you know, the guys went up. Uh, I think we had 18 or 19 people there, including uh, Coach Gowing and, and Tony Martindale. So, uh, you know, we got to partake with the Stanley Cup for a day, which was pretty cool. So Greg's has never forgotten about uh, his roots, where he started, and, uh, and Laurie, and, and no, good man. And he actually, uh, the, a story I kind of shared with uh, with Randy briefly was uh, he was probably paramount in one of the greatest days I ever had uh, off ice. 
between uh, between games once in Tampa. So uh, we can talk about that later. Sure. <laughs> the fact that one of the things that really was really it sticks in my mind, and I was really really uh, you know it was interesting to me is when you had played for the Vancouver Can- or tried out with the Vancouver Canucks, right? At one point in your it, before you became a referee, and the thing this uh, this for uh, set it up like this in the sense that we really didn't have a lot of referees that had played or lines that had played at the national height. We had Kevin McGuire came along eventually, but we had maybe Bill McCurry had some some minor pro experience, I believe. But I really didn't know many players that had had like had actually been in an NHL training camp and was trying out for a national hockey league team that came into the officiating like you had. So I thought that was one of the, that was one of the things that I was really like uh you know really struck me big time that here was an NHL ref or player now coming into the NHL and now today that's pretty well common, is it not? Yeah, that's a long question there, Lance. Um, yeah. It is true in the uh the 89-90 season when we won the uh Ontario Championships uh at Laurier, uh four of us were invited to NHL camps. Rob Dobbs went to Pittsburgh and uh, he ended up uh I he played at least one game if not two with the Penguins uh over the course of his career and then uh Mark Lyons Mike Maurice and I were invited to Vancouver's camp. Uh, Mark declined because he'd already been there once when he was playing for Kingston and been drafted. And I, I went out there. I knew I would never have a, you know, as John Candy would say in playing trades and automobiles, there's probably a better chance of finding the one-legged ballerina than me playing in the NHL. But, um, you know, it was a great experience. It kind of, I was already officiating. I had, uh, started, I was in the OHA and, and, uh, was trying to get into the OHL, but what it did is uh, it kind of added to my resume about uh, uh, my skating ability and, and size and whatnot. Uh, so I went out there. Yeah, I was at the training camp, but it was, uh, man, those players, they're so good. They, uh, I have a new appreciation uh, to exactly how good they are. Uh, Igor Larianov just really just blew my mind. He could do things with his feet that I couldn't even do with my stick. He could take passes. And like just right on his skate up to his stick in full motion. I, I'm just like, I was so impressed. So they did every little thing right. And then they, every now and then would do some, uh, some crazy things. So I, I was there for a week and, uh, I was released and, uh, came back and resumed my fishing shortly after, uh, they, uh, the OHL hired me on as, uh, as a lines person. So I think that was kind of a stepping stone and, and it brought a little bit of attention and definitely now the uh the director of officiating for the nhl he really seems to focus on uh give me an, an ex player and i'll turn him into an official and uh that's that's his prerogative and i know the other leagues are doing the same thing they're having tryouts and whatnot for players that have played and uh i'm uh supervising right now with the Ontario hockey association and i've approached some players that are reaching the end of their junior career and say, Hey, have you ever thought about getting into officiating? And they still have to do the work. They have to go and, and get their certification, which some mm-hmm. of them don't really know about and don't really think that they should do. But, uh, you know, it, it's part of the mandate and you, you need to learn the rules you need to learn a little bit about officiating. But you, when you have that ex player, they have a real steep learning curve and they can, uh, to catch on, not that not that all of them will and and uh, whatnot, but that's their prerogative. And yeah, it's a, it's a good stepping stone. Hmm. <clears throat> no, Brian Burke was the he was GM with Vancouver at that time, was he not? Uh, Brian was the president of the team, oh. and uh, yeah, he uh, the the next season when I started working full time in the OHL, he was at my first game, and he sent me a really nice letter after saying that uh, he's really happy to see that I was joining the OHL staff and and uh, that. You know, eventually he thought perhaps I'd make it to the National Hockey League and just a really, really tremendous guy. And during the course of my career, Berkey uh, would always pop in and say hi. He was our boss for a while. He was Colin Campbell uh, at one point. And um, Brian, like he was just such a such an amazing guy and fun to talk to. And my last game in Toronto, which uh, was 30, uh, sorry, four years ago, he came in the room between periods and we took a nice picture together. But the one thing about Berkey is he loved truculents. He loved fighters. And when I was at training camp, uh, I fought Gene Odrick, not by choice. I fought Gene Odrick because he came at me. And uh, Berkey loved it. I mean, Gino pounded me, but Berkey loved it. He would tell people I fought him. Well, he didn't say that I, I had my clock clean. He'd just say that I fought him. So, 
pretty funny. Yeah. So when you were a player, were, were you not doing any uh, officiating at all, sort of as a, a, a part-time thing? Did you really just start uh, when you uh, finished your career at Laurier? Oh, no, no. I cut my teeth uh, in the cold rinks around Seaforth. Uh, okay. Places like Brussels and Mitchell and Clinton and, and Seaforth, obviously. But I started officiating when I was 12. Okay. Uh, 80 from town named Joyce McClure. Uh, asked myself and two of my friends if we'd be interested in officiating because minor hockey need referees. And they didn't have any kids around the age of 12 to 13, 14. And, you know, you had to hire or not hire. You had to bring in officials sometimes from out of town. Well, when you bring in an official from out of town, then they get mileage money. It just adds to the budget. So uh, she asked us and we did it. I enjoyed it. Uh, it was something that, you know, you kind of, you're 12, 13 years old, you're out on the ice and you're part of the hockey game, you're skating. Uh, and at the end of the day, they come in, knock on the door and they, you know, here's $5. I'm like, whoa, I'm getting paid to do something that I really like. This is, this is a pretty good gig. So, yeah. um, you know, that, that's where it started. And I just continued on and I played four years in St. Mary's, uh, for the Lincolns junior B, but I still maintain my referee and status and I would do games on, uh, during the week when I could or on weekends and tournaments. And, you know, I really liked it. And uh, it's really funny, but uh, where I just, the, the light switch turned on for me was a gentleman from our area named Claude Daw used to um, uh, get me to work lines for him in the WOAA senior. And Saturday night, Wellesley at 8.30, I was 19.20, or, or Lincoln's had been eliminated. But the barn was rocking. Everybody from Wellesley was there. The two McSorley boys played there. There was fights. It was, I'm like, this is awesome. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of like, hey, I could, I could really go for doing this for a living. So, yeah. Scott, I, I understand the, the value certainly of, of experience uh, when you get into officiating. But, but I, I would think that, that one of the main prerequisites uh, is, is skating ability. And uh, is that not uh, something that, uh, you know, that they look at as, as very, very important? Yeah, they, if, the fishing is all about positioning. And uh, there's two elements of positioning. One is your skiing ability. And uh, the other is just your kind of awareness and mm. of where to be and where, where to get. It. I like to use the terminology, the best sideline. And uh, Definitely, you know, skating is paramount. If you can't skate, you cannot officiate. And we've always, as an association, we would argue that with uh, the NHL when we're in collective bargaining agreement that, you know, we had to do a skill. We had to be a skilled skater to do our job. And they would compare us to like Major League Baseball umpires or basketball referees or football officials. And uh, as far as like salaries and whatnot, they just had to run. We had to be able to skate. If you can't skate, you can't officiate. And, uh, you know, they, the NHL would look at it from a different perspective, but absolutely if uh, um, skating is paramount, and I know that the current director of officiating values that out of his uh, out of his employees and uh, taking those ex-players that have played minor pro or high college level, uh, they, they can definitely skate. I would think your size uh, would have been a, a real a bonus for you too. Even as as a nineteen year old, uh, being an official at a at a senior game, you know, a six foot four nineteen year old is going to be a pretty impressive figure out there. Well, I think that's why Claude uh, <laughs> brought me along uh, that during the game, and also maybe to lead the the charge trying to get out of the lobby if the fans are happy after the game. But no, uh, those game like they were. Players that could play hockey still, that most of them had played junior at a higher level. Again, I bring up the McSorley boys. Uh, they were out there, Marty Shunker brothers, and, and uh, they were pretty tough characters. So there were some fights, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was nothing gets you more pumped up when you're trying to break up a fight. So definitely, my size was an attribute. Uh, I, I jokingly tell people that. Uh, my first year of junior B, I was working a, a game in the playoffs. It was Stratford, Brantford, and there was a gentleman playing for uh, Brantford, and it was the fourth game of a uh, best of seven, and they were getting blown out by the Cullitans. And he, uh, for some reason, really, really didn't like the referee that I was working with. And uh, they had a little bit of an exchange, and 
it ended with uh, the referee uh, blowing his whistle, pumping his hips to give him 10 minutes, and the guy threw his gloves in the air and started chasing around the ice. Mm-hmm. My partner uh, was able to get a hold of his jersey and his elbow pads and his shoulder pads. I had been on the other side of the ice, and I you know, put the puck in my pocket, and I took off after him. And this gentleman and I, we played four years of junior B against each other, and uh, we played in the All-Star game twice as teammates. So I was able to, to catch him, and I grabbed him by the pants. He's naked from the, the waist up, and I just said, hey, you know you know me, you know what I what I did, and there's no way you're touching my referee tonight. Uh, you could either you know, go off the ice calmly, or and I had my, his pants like the old, when you're fighting and you kind of get tied up, you grab a guy by the pant leg and you lift it up and, you know, throw him on the ice and kind of body slam. I said, I'm going to body slam you if you don't want to leave the ice. And he said, okay, all right, all right. You know, <laughs> and after that, that referee, he took me everywhere he could. Because <laughs> he said, I saved his life. This is like that. Well, you know what? I, I got to understand the milestones that happen in the National Hockey League and all through your career. What do you think one of your biggest milestones is that you really feel is one of your biggest achievements that you feel that is really something that you're proud of? Well, anytime you work for the Stanley Cup Finals, it's uh, it's just an attribute. It's it's more, uh, you know, it, it's great to do it, but it's something that you can share with your family. And uh, probably my last Stanley Cup, uh, when it was uh, L.A. played the Rangers, uh, you know, two huge major U.S. markets and uh, it was just I knew it would be my last one because I was declining in my skating ability and whatnot uh, and I, I, I soaked it up I, I soaked in every minute uh, my family came to New York to the game and uh, I remember uh, the tickets were $600 U.S. so they're you know, like 15 rows from the ice but Madison Square Garden in the finals is pretty rocking and the street value of those tickets was probably two thousand dollars each. So I, I gave my wife the four tickets, and Colleen goes, "You're telling me that I'm holding eight thousand dollars worth of tickets?" And I go, "Yeah." She goes, "I'm going shopping. I'll watch a game on TV." So uh, it was great because the, the, the family comes along, and the kids come on the ice with you and skate and whatnot. So I'll uh, I always remember those, and you know the the two outdoor games I did uh, were awesome too. One was at uh, University of Michigan and. The other one was at the Cotton Bowl in, in Dallas. And again, the family comes and they get to skate on the ice. And uh, we took a great family picture uh, at the one in uh, Dallas. So, and we took one in, in Michigan too. It was just, it was so cold. My my kids said after that game, like, Dad, if you ever get an outdoor game again, we're not going unless it's somewhere hot. So <laughs> I, I was able to appease them by getting the game in, in Dallas. Hmm. I had a lot of friends uh, went to that game at Michigan and, uh, I, I remember a lot of them saying that the drive home was just a nightmare that night because of all the traffic trying to get out of uh, the big house and, and getting across the border. Did you drive back to Guelph that night? Do you remember? Oh, no, we stayed over. We had uh, the the NHL. They obviously paid for your rooms. Uh, we had, uh, you know, two rooms and we had made plans as a, as a crew to go out for dinner after with our families. And uh, the funny thing is, uh, we had a pretty good parking spot, obviously, because we were working, but our family couldn't come with us. <clears throat> and my family was lucky. They were able to find some parking close by and made it back. But one guy's wife and his four kids, they spent two hours trying to get back to the hotel because it was just normally for the football game, uh, the, the people park on lawns near the, the football stadium and that none of them could do that because there's so much snow there and it snowed during the game. So it was really, really, really jammed up after, but no, we stayed over and, and went out for uh, supper. Very good. Scott, who, who were some of the, the, the real tough guys you had to deal with in, in, in the NHL? Oh, there's uh, so many of them, but uh, funny that the tough guys were, they were the easiest guys to get along with. If you ever look at a team, composition it's usually the tough guy that they're the community minded person they're always helping out with uh with you know hospitals and charity visits and they almost had their own little union the the uh the the, the tough guys because if one team didn't have a tough guy then the other team didn't need a tough guy so they when they fought nine times out of ten it was just kind of for show it was entertainment we knew it was coming they'd be on the ice and they'd talk on the the wing hey we're gonna go yeah we're gonna go so as alliance person we would drop the puck right away because you, you didn't want to fight at one time if you fought before the puck was dropped you uh you received a, a lengthier suspension so 
we're always taught, even if they've started throwing punches, just throw the puck somewhere on the ice. And we'll say it's been a face off and, and then tend to what they're doing. But they were, you know, they like Bob Probert, he just did his job. Uh, he was, he was like just amazing. I never had a, a, a Domi a Probert fight, but uh, I had a few with Probert. Joey Kosher was a, was a tough guy too. I watched him one punch a guy one time. There's just like being an agitator. Finally, Joey says, okay, let's go and drop his gloves. And the guy took a swing and missed and Joey popped him right in the, in the button. And the guy was out before he even hit the ice. So, you know, guys like that. And then Gino Ojik was a tough guy and, and I had fought him, but, uh, Gino would always say hi to me. And, and my last trip to uh, Vancouver, Gino came down to the room and we had our picture taken and Gino was walking around introducing me as one of his teammates. I'm like, yeah, for about seven days, Gino, but, um, you know, they were, they were the funnier guys like Stu Grimson, uh, guys would sit on the bench. Like Sean McKenna was a tough guy for Pittsburgh. They, they were the most entertaining guys because they sat on the bench all night and they wanted to stay active. So they would, uh, kind of be in your ear. And a lot of it was, you know, just joking around and, Again, I ran into Marty McSorley at a, a Guelph Storm game recently, and I introduced him to my family, and I just said, Marty made my job so easy. He went out on the ice, and if guys were skating around, acting tough, Marty would just kind of look at us officials and say, you guys get out of here. we you know, back off a couple feet. He'd say, okay, anybody here wants to go, we'll go right now. If not, zip it. You know, we, we, We're on a road trip. We're heading to the next city. And that'd be it. There'd be no more screwing around the rest of the game. So it's like, oh, thanks, Marty. But <laughs> fun times. Hmm. That's great. You always see, I mean, the linesmen are right in the middle of those things. It, you must take the odd punch. You must have been pretty, uh, you know, you must have been pretty banged up a little bit over the years, were you? Uh, no, it's, a lot of it's technique. And uh, when two players are fighting, uh, <laughs> hey, that's that's nothing more tiring in the world than, than trying to fight. So you kind of wait for them to, the, the tough guys, when they fought, they'd look and say, okay, we're done. And we go, okay. And then, or we would yell, hey, let us know when you're finished. And they would, they would say, okay, yeah, that's good. They'd kind of tie up. But it was the middleweights. When they went, they just didn't know when to stop. They didn't want to stop fighting because they didn't fight a whole lot. But when they went, they just, they're, they're throwing like jackhammers. Um, again, you try to wait. And the technique is if uh, my partner and I, and I'm trying to teach it to some of the, uh, the, the guys working in junior and the, and the ladies working in junior hockey. Um, it, it, a lot of it's technique when they grab onto each other, you want to neutralize them from the elbows up with the little, you know, over under with your arms. But I would keep my, the back of my head, um, which is protected by a helmet. Plus my head's pretty hard. Um, I would keep that. I'd face the guy that I'm going to, uh, to subdue or, or to, to grasp. And the, my partner would do the same. But my helmet then is basically facing uh, the guy that's throwing the punches. And so if he's going to punch, he's going to hit the back of my head, and that's not going to hurt me. So, so with retirement now, <clears throat> Scott, do you have events you're going on that you're doing and that you're really passionate about? Want to talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, sure. We got like another hour to talk about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's kind of like everyone says, what do you think about retirement? And I said, retirement's great. You just have to have a plan. And, um, uh, one of my plans or one of my thoughts was to pass on my passion for, uh, specifically D-Day and the Battle of Normandy. Uh, I had an uncle, George Miller, that was a, a D-Day, uh, uh, soldier. Uh, he went in with the, uh, early waves. Uh, he was a Royal Canadian engineer, 86 bridging company. And, uh, uncle George's, uh, role was when the Germans retreated, they would blow up the bridges and uncle George and his group, they would either string together a Bailey bridge to cross rivers or possibly a wooden bridge. And as uncle George would say, they would build it at night and then the Germans would blow it up during the day. So then they'd build another one the next night and they'd blow it up again. But, um, I just, when I found out that uncle George was a, a D-Day veteran, it just kind of, I'd always been interested in, in war movies for some reason. I, I just loved watching them and, and the, 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 role they played and, and what they did to liberate uh, uh, Europe. And when I found out Uncle George was a, a D-Day veteran, I was like, whoa, it just uh, increased my passion for it. So, you know, we're a lot, we spend a lot of time on the road. Uh, I, I start reading books and the more I read, the more I wanted to learn. And the more I, I learned, I said, okay, I need to go to, to Normandy. And my wife and I went over there, uh, we were in France uh, in 2007. So we, she, uh, let us do a one day trip out, uh, which was 
which was great. It's the first time I'd been there, but it was an American trip and we stopped at five different places and none of them were Canadian. They were the Omaha Beach, uh, Omaha Beach Cemetery, Pegasus Bridge. And I just looked at her and I said, I have to come back. Like, I, this is just a tease that I need to get back. So my uncle passed away in 2009. So I took my oldest son over as a tribute to my uncle George and we did a five day self-guided tour. And again, it just like scratched the surface. So, uh, for the 70, 70th anniversary in 2014, I had organized a little trip for myself and two friends, but, uh, I ended up working the Stanley cup finals. So I didn't go, but my friends went and cause I you know, paid for everything and, uh, you know, we split the costs evenly and I'm thinking I need to do this like when it's just appropriate. So for the 75th anniversary, I organized a trip and, uh, uh, there's nine of us. Uh, I rented three houses, uh, ironically one in each of the Canadian villages that, uh, or the villages that the Canadians liberated on D-Day and uh, had a, a nine person van and drove around. And I'm thinking this is something maybe I could do for a week or two or a month in the summer is take over like-minded people like myself. It's a real niche thing and maybe show them around. And I had, had a plan to do, uh, uh, COVID obviously, uh, played a little bit of a factor. Uh, I had a month's worth of people going, I'd rented a place for a month. I had the ban for a month and then the war in the Ukraine happened and COVID, uh, was, was making a resurgence. So three of the four weeks decided to cancel, but the one week went over. And again, it was just a, a real amazing experience that I had. And, and I have another group coming over, uh, or going over this summer, um, uh, Again, I have five people signed up. I have room for two more, but uh, I'm staying in the same place that I rented two years ago. It's in Wallace Shimmer, which is kind of in the middle of the whole D-Day invasion area. They have a German set up four 155 millimeter guns there. It's a, it's a huge battery, and these guns they could fire a 2,000 pound shell, 22 miles or sorry, um, 11 miles, and that's why the on D-Day, the, the big battleships and whatnot and, and the landing uh, craft transports, they had to stay at least 11 miles offshore. A small, the destroyers came in closer and some of the cruisers, but uh, they had to stay that far off uh, because of the risk of being hit by a shell. And it's just amazing that something like that could travel that far. Hmm. I know you've also spent some time, you know, just dealing or meeting with the... Uh, um, you know, Medal of Honor recipients from, you know, World War II, the Korean War. What's it like to meet those people? I was just in awe. Like it's, you're sitting at a table or talking to somebody that just did something heroic. Like it, I, I don't know. I, 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 words can't really describe how I felt like a, a kid on Christmas, uh, you know, seeing, meeting Santa Claus and it just so overpowering the emotions and Again, that's where Steve Grigg ties in. Uh, every year, the uh, the Medal of Honor Society Gala, and, and for those that don't know it, the Medal of Honor is the highest award that a U.S. Uh, uh, combat veteran, or sorry, not a veteran, but a, a soldier, airman, uh, Navy uh, service personnel, that's the highest award they can win. And quite, it's not even, sorry, they don't win it. They're awarded it. It's uh, nothing like that is won. And they receive it for actions that, for many of them, they receive it posthumously because it's just amazing what they do. And uh, to be, I found out that the Medal of Honor Society Gala, they have a, uh, a one year, every year they have a, a gathering and the one year is in Tampa. So I had seen a picture where all the living Medal of Honor recipients that could make it to the, to that convention, they went out and they dropped the puck between Pittsburgh and and uh, Tampa Bay Lightning. Now the Tampa Bay Lightning owner, he had actually funded the entire gala. He wrote the check for a couple million dollars so they could all come. And it's a week long event. They go out to the community and they talk about their stories. And at that time, there was only uh, three living World War II recipients. And one of them was there, Woody uh, Williams was his name. And uh, I had seen that they were dropping the puck and, and I texted uh, Grixie and I went, hey, Grixie, like, I, I'm coming in for the game in two nights. Uh, is there any chance that I'd be able to meet some of these uh, Medal of Honor recipients? And Grixie said, what do you want to be my date? There's a gala tomorrow night and it's uh, black tie. And I'm like, well, I don't have a, a, a touch with me. That's fine. So I was Grixie's date, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, every table had a, a living Medal of Honor recipient. And the gentleman that was our table, he was a uh, 
a world, he was a World War II veteran in the sense that he signed up. He was of Japanese descent from New Mexico, and they wanted to put him in an internment camp. And the, the people from New Mexico said, no, he's part of our town, and uh, they wouldn't allow it. So he signed up and volunteered, and on his way over to uh, to Europe, the war ended. So he came back and he resumed <clears throat> his work at a garage uh, gas station. And then when the Korean War uh, broke out, he ended up volunteering to wet. He received a vow of honor. So mm-hmm. he was great. They have challenge coins that uh, various uh, military in the in the U.S. have. And uh, he had his own personal uh, Medal of Honor challenge coin and had the picture of him and four other recipients receiving their Medal of Honor from then President uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was the Supreme Allied Commander in World War II uh, for D-Day. Anyways, uh, he sat down at the table, and I was there with uh, Tampa Bay uh, coach John Cooper and his wife and Greg Z and a couple other Tampa Bay personnel. He said, I only have one challenge coin left. Uh, can anyone tell me what years the, the Korean War were? And I fired out right away, 50 to 53. And he goes, yeah. And he handed me the coin. And John Cooper looked at me and goes, well, that wasn't fair. And I said, yeah, I kind of know a little bit about World War II history and even like a bit about the Korean War. So, um, yeah, and then I, I was able to meet uh, Woody. Woody passed away a couple years ago. Uh, at that time, he was about 98 years old. He was a, uh, a Marine on Iwo Jima, and he received his uh, Medal of Honor for loading up. Uh, he At the time, he wasn't a flamethrower. Uh, person, but uh, the flamethrower had been killed. So he said, I used to do it. So he strapped it on. And uh, five or six times he went behind Japanese lines and uh, and took out bunkers and, and pillboxes. And he's under, uh, like, there's four guys that were scouting for him and, and uh, being kind of like a sniper to, to help him out. But he said, uh, like, four times or five times he went and did it and came back and loaded up the gel again and went back. And you just sit there and I'm like, oh my goodness, I met somebody that did something like that at Iwo Jima and oh my goodness, it, it just like chills went up my spine. Yeah. I think it, I think it's pretty cool, Scott, that, uh, you know, 20 years uh, you've dealt with, uh, you know, with, with so many hockey heroes, sports heroes, uh, and then to recognize uh, that really our, our real heroes, our true heroes, uh, were those guys and, and, and gals that, uh, that went over there and, and, and fought for us and, and fought for our country. And uh, I, I think that's wonderful what you're doing, and, and uh, I, I think it's really, really cool. Yeah, it's, uh, again, the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. And uh, I, I would always uh, say that, like, I was in hockey, I, I was in entertainment. It was a job. That's uh, Lancel, you know, I'll say that, you know, he, you can't be starstruck. You're you go from city to city. You work your game. Um, it, basically, that's how I um, earned my living, and and that's fine. But th- these people, um, the, the veterans, what they did is is just it's it's mind blowing that they. And I always ask my uncle, and he's such a humble man, and he didn't think of himself uh, as anything. But I think they're all heroes. And I kept asking him, you know, Uncle George, why did you do it? And, for years and years, he couldn't tell me. And finally, one day, he looked at me and said, I did it because it was the right thing to do. And I think that's what they all did. And, and the veterans I've met, they would just, they're very humble. And they, they would all say that the real heroes are the ones that are still buried over there. And um, the more I the more I do what I've been doing, I've learned some stories of uh, some of the, the people that are buried over there. And the one year, uh, when I went in 2019 for the 75th anniversary, we were able to hook up with a... Uh, a group of students that were there from New Brunswick and they were following the footsteps of the North Shore New Brunswick Regiment. They were part of the uh, 8th Brigade uh, on D-Day, 3rd Infantry Division. They landed at St. Aubin. And that year they had uh, one of the historical vignettes came out, a one minute thing, and it was about the commanding officer of A Company. His name was Archie McNaughton. And uh, he was a 47 year old World War One veteran. And they told him, you know, you've already put your time in. He said, no, these are my boys. I want to be with them. And they were uh, closing it on a town called Talville. And they didn't think it had been totally liberated, uh, but they were ordered in. So like a true leader, he walked in first and uh, he was machine gunned down by an MG-42. And, uh, you know, I went in 2019. We were there for the unveiling of a plaque uh, where he was killed and the bullet holes are still in the wall. And we went to his uh, grave. And it's just like, it's very, very powerful uh, when you start thinking about those stories. Yeah. So Scott, as, as your career was 
towards the latter end and I was kind of had left the league. Like there was a lot of ways that things changed in the league. So what what were some of the really positive changes that happened in the league as it went through kind of a transition into the you know towards the you know towards those last years of your career, your last quarter of your career? I think the biggest change, uh unfortunately it happened during the the, the NHL lockout in uh, two thousand four, two thousand five. But Shanahan and uh, a bunch of other guys got together. They had a Shanahan committee or Shanahan summit. And they came to the league and said, you know what? The game of hockey, it's uh, it's about skill and passing and shooting and scoring goals and whatnot. Why are we allowing teams to clutch and grab and slow the game down? And they they gave the officials, uh, the referees particularly, the the power to go out. And the, they flipped the mindset from being that, oh, I don't want to call it penalty because that penalty, if I call it, it might be an influence of the game, to thinking that if I don't call it, I'm influencing the game. And the skill was able to shine. The the skating was able to shine. And the goal scoring was able to shine. So I think that's the biggest thing in my 28 years was coming out of the lockout and the enforcement of slashing, uh, hooking, holding, tripping, clutching and grabbing, interference. They started calling that and uh, the game just sped up. And again, we, now we see the skill of people like Connor McDavid and, and Sidney Crosby and and Austin Matthews, and it's just like, that's what true hockey fans like. Now, if you're in the States, especially the Southern States, they like to see the fights, but, and that's kind of gone down the wayside, because if you can't skate and play, then you're not going to be able to play in the league nowadays, and and I think that's a positive change, and in fact, uh, when I'm, uh, I, I've been an assistant coach for four years with the University of Guelph Women, and one of the things that really pains me on the bench is the amount of stuff they do not call. They they allow, it's almost like slashing is a skill. And we were always taught as a, an official when that, that stick goes parallel to the ice, one of two things is going to happen. Uh, it could be a hook or it's going to be a slash. And slashing is not a skill. It's used to intimidate or it's used to injure. It should be called. And it just, it was very frustrating to watch. We had a really skilled team this year at the University of Guelph, the women. And, uh, we just, I didn't feel that we got, uh, we, we received very uh, good officiating throughout the year. They, they level the playing field then. They, they allow a team, and the one team I said they should change their name from whatever it is to the Lumberjacks because that's all they do out there is this whack, hack, back. And these poor young ladies, like the, the, the welts and the bruises that they get on their wrists. And I try to explain to them, I worked the game in Pittsburgh, sorry, it's Pittsburgh versus the Ottawa Senators. And one of the classiest guys in the league that I ever met was Mark Mathot. And Sidney Crosby just gave him a little kind of love tap, as we would call it, in his hands. And Mark lost the tip of his finger, his baby finger. And it doesn't take much. Uh, why why are we allowing the stick to be parallel to the ice and whack it at the person's hands? That's a lacrosse move. That's not a hockey rule. And the gloves, they're not, they're not like lacrosse. Those are like they're they're like basically steel gloves in lacrosse. In hockey, they're not. And uh, I just think it's a shame. And and when I'm when I'm out officiating uh supervising right now i try to pass that on to the to the coaches and to the players and to the, the officials and the management I, i'm like we all need to work together to make the game better we can't be we can't be adversaries we have to be allies if we're going to grow the game and the one thing that i really you know sit there and you can't make a playoff adjustment like like i'd like to but um you, the slashing needs to go it's just these these players are out there whacking and hacking and it just it's, it's not a good thing for the game but using the stick has always been something we've always battled with with players and stuff in the game of hockey. But I do agree because I thought that with the when they come to that 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 summit series, the biggest thing that changed was basically the fact that we used to be in the in our day when I was there. If you put your arm in the air, you really had to justify what you were doing on the call. It had to be you know at the right time, right score, all these things we had in mind. But there was also the fact that when we had when, when we went forward after the summit with the, that you're talking about. It became more of an onus on the player. So you put your, and the media had to buy into it. So when the media sees the referee put his arm in the air, they look and they say the player did the player was wrong, not the referee. And I think that helped really change the the you know you know how they saw the referees and their job in regards to making the call. And the and the, and the media buys into that, and they were showing the call. They showed the hook. They showed. They go, yes, that's the right call. Player bad, referee good. So I think that helped a lot. You know that summit series that Shanahan put together that in that lockout year, that chasing yeah, Eagle quite dramatically. Yeah, no, for sure. The uh, you know unless you're Jack Edwards of Boston, that every penalty of Bruin is wrong. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, the, the announcers and the broadcasters, they would kind of buy into it and say, yeah, this is, you know, better for the game. And it, it's a, it was a tough thing for the officials, but once they, and, and people like Bobby Clark in, in Philadelphia, and, and I think Hitchcock was the coach there, they said, this won't last, this won't last, this won't last, and it did. And, and ultimately they lost their jobs because Bobby Clark had built a, he just hired or just uh, signed Hatcher and Ratchie from uh, other organizations, and they're big, immobile defensemen, kind of like me when I played. And they, they there's no place for them in the AHL anymore. So um, it, it was a very drastic change, and there was a a lot of people that they never played in the NHL after that because they didn't have the skating skills to keep up. Well, the speed of the game goes to a higher level too. When that happens, and sometimes the hits are a lot harder than they were in the days, and guys would hold people up and stuff. But I mean, we have rules for those things too. The biggest thing I see in junior hockey now coming through is that their they you know the, their work with their sticks is is kind of more subtle now. It's not quite the big slash to the hands and that. But they do a lot of down low stuff. What do you think of that, Scott? The, the down low stuff they do with their sticks. Have you seen much of that? Yeah, no. I, like I don't watch a whole lot of NHL hockey, um, and I do watch a fair bit of junior here in Guelph at the the Storm, um, but. Yeah, no, they, it's, you're still allowed to go after the player's stick down low. However you do so, you run the risk of breaking the other person's stick. And typically that's a penalty. It's not always a penalty, but, uh, I was, it's funny cause I was, uh, supervising at a game, a junior B game. And, uh, I, I kind of have a, a reputation of if I go to a game, it's probably going to overtime. And, uh, I have that following me around right now in the junior hockey ranks, but this particular night, uh, there was a, a five on four power play. And it was Siskins playing uh, uh, air, and uh, there was a, a Siskin that slashed an air stick in the slot, and it broke. And they didn't make a call. So after the game, I went in, and it, it got went to overtime. And the guy said right away, he "Goes it's your fault that we went to overtime." They said, "No, it's your fault." I go, "Why did you call a penalty when there was uh, the power play a five on three late in the game? There's a chance a goal is going to be scored, and you chose not to call it." And he's like, "Well." You know, I didn't think it was a very big slash. And so I go, hey, that's your prerogative. I, I tell them, you know, to call what you can best defend. I go, you're making a defense and that's fine. But, you know, typically when a stick's broken, you go, hey, your honor, I'd like to present this as evidence A. Uh, it's a broken stick. And uh, he kind of giggled. And the next day he looked at it and says, yeah, you were right. And I said, no, like you made you made a good argument. And you explained it to the coach. He bought your argument. And that's fine. He justified it. But. Yeah, no, like the broken sticks, they happen so much. And, uh, you know, if they go down low by the, by the stick blade, that's fine. You can not, that's always been part of like slash the puck away from the player's, um, stick. It's when they go in the hands and the NHL's done a really good job identifying. It may not be the hands, but if it's close enough to the hands, then it's getting called. And I just wish that would trickle down to, to like junior B and C and, uh, the OHL is doing a pretty good job at it. They're they're trying to protect their players uh, with those slashes to the hands. Hmm. Well, the biggest thing too is that it's a four hundred fifty dollars stick. I well, mean, Lance, I mean that's that's a, that's the biggest factor involved. It's like it's pretty expensive slash. Yeah, but Lance, you know, with all your money, you must buy like thirty oh, or forty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's cheap. <laughs> Hey, uh, Scott, you, you touched on uh, the, the coaching uh, at the University of Guelph a little bit, but uh, just talk about that experience, uh, how, how much you've enjoyed that, and do you see more of coaching in your future? Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I was looking for something again. I needed to have a plan, and my last season before I, uh, before I went to training camp, I had uh, my knee scoped, and uh, I had to go and do some rehab skiing by myself, and I knew that the University of Guelph women's coach Rachel Flanagan. She's married to C Fourth Lat, and uh, I would pop in every day and just say, "Hey, how's it going, ladies?" And by the way, I saw that uh, Jeff's not on your staff anymore. He's coaching junior. Do you need an assistant coach next year? She said, "Well, we'll think about it." And I guess it kind of like the more I went in and the more I I told them, I kind of talked myself into the or talked them into hire me. And it was a new experience. So uh, the first year was COVID, which is really tough because we had to practice and. Uh, in cohorts of eight or nine people, the St. Drills, uh, you know, three times over with different kids and we didn't play any games. And the next year COVID was still around. We played a few games and, uh, there, I've never been around a, a better group of, uh, unbelievable young women than the, the Griffin women's hockey team. They are just so amazing. They, they're like daughters to me. Um, you know, anything I could do to help them, I, I would try. And, uh, 
it was a really positive experience uh, for me. I, I, I grew as a person. I grew more patient. Uh, uh, not that I was would have been impatient, and yelling and screaming, but kind of like in the, the the male sense of things in, in hockey, there was a lot of uh, coaches yelling at you and you know and punishment if you didn't do it, and you know nothing like uh, putting the pucks away. Like I think we we ran a foul of Wayne Gowling once uh, on a uh, Christmas turnout in. Calgary and we came back and we didn't see a puck for three practices. So that doesn't happen anymore, but, um, the message was sent to, to Wayne and they kind of brought us together as a team. And we went on to have that great run. And unfortunately we lost two one to Moncton, but, uh, just amazing kids. And, and, uh, they were a joy to be around. I'd be on the ice with them and, and little Jessica Cooley is Steve's daughter. She's just a bundle of energy and she's out there and she just has a smile on her face. And it took her four years. But she finally scored her first goal this year, and I was so happy. I went down the bench. I was like, "Cooley scored, Cooley scored, Cooley scored." And then uh, my wife—that's one of her uh, favorites uh, to watch. And uh, I had uh, my wife text her and say, "Congrats, you know, Scott was so happy. I'm so happy." And then we had a game the next day, and Jess told me, "I said, hey, why don't you text Colleen and say, you know, maybe as a reward for my first goal, you could make me a cheesecake." <laughs> and I said to Cooley, "We'll split it." And uh, she texted Colleen, and Colleen said, "I can't believe Scott would stoop so low as to get you to try to get me to make him a cheesecake." So, just just a lot of fun. Like great kids. There's a girl, Hannah Tate from Exeter, Ontario. Uh, we're in a book together, uh, not together, together, but we're in the same book uh, called Huron County Hockey Heroes. And I would jokingly say all the time, uh, "Yeah, you know, Tater and I were both Huron County Hockey Heroes." Uh, I'm probably like my dad jokes would uh, would get them because they'd be sitting in the room, and you know, Tater would be. Thomas uh, tune or singing some lyrics and I'd say, oh, who sings that? And she says, oh, Belinda Carla. I go, yeah, she sings it, not you. And she kept falling for it. And finally she caught on and said, I'm not falling for it anymore. But again, a really positive experience. The only negative experience that I, I really uh, experienced, and it was a, a big one, and it came uh, to the forefront, uh, was the officiating. I, I could not stomach uh, watching our girls uh, on the ice and the just the way that the officials did not react to penalties and call penalties in their game management. And, uh, so I, I have quit. I'm not, uh, I, can't, I can't be on the bench and not that I yelled very much, but you know, I would, uh, say, yeah, that that's kind of wrong. And the, the officials would come over and they were just, and then the Ontario women's hockey association, I don't know why they're just so difficult to, to talk to and to reason with. And I'm sitting there, going, I ref or I officiated 2000 games in the NHL. I know what I'm talking about, but that wasn't my, that wasn't my responsibility or job on the team to, to talk to the officials, but I would kind of tell this year we had an interim head coach, uh, Katie Moore, and she did an amazing job. She was OUA coach of the year. And I kind of like over time would just say, this is what you need to ask. This is what you need to ask. This is what you need to say. And she did, but they would come over and they had every excuse in the world. The, again, the, the, the calls they make. And calls he tried to justify, um, it just I, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, <laughs> you know, you're talking to me. Like, I know the rule book. I know the fl- officiating. Like, wh- how can you do that? So I've started officiating, uh, supervising uh, recently, and uh, I, I came to the conclusion that I couldn't do both. I couldn't be at the rinks five nights a week, a couple games for the couple games for the Griffin women, um, and then, uh, you know, three or four games of uh, junior hockey. I just couldn't be away from the house that much. So I had to make a decision, do one or the other. Definitely the, the poor officiating and, the, and they just don't seem to want to get any better. They're, they're content to have people out there that control the fate of games. And coach Jeff knows like we spend five days a week practicing. We play twice on the weekend. It's like six days a week for, uh, for seven months. And we go out and we have to deal with that officiating. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I had reached my my boiling point, and I didn't want to boil over on the bench some night and make a real fool out of me or the Griffin program. So, right now, it's best for Scott Driscoll to step away from coaching, and maybe something will open up in the future. But I really enjoy uh, supervising, and ironically, I can see some of these females that uh, that work in the Ontario uh, Women's Hockey Association. They're also Ontario Hockey Association officials, and I can uh, the lines people have been great. I've been give them advice and they take it back to their OUA games when they're working us and they're great. I just found the referee and they, they seem to not want to improve. They thought they were, they were good enough as they were. And again, it was like, I could spend two hours talking about uh, some of the calls over the years that just like, just mind blowing. So 
Um, but yeah, we'll move on. <laughs> Scott, did you did you win a national title there when you were there? At uh, Guelph? Yeah. No, they won uh, the year before that I started, or two years before I started. Like, they won in 2019, and I started uh, in 2020. So, yeah, they had, it, and it's very cyclic, as you know, in sports. Uh, they had a tremendous team. They won the Nationals in 2019, but they, they lost eight players to graduation. So they were kind of starting over again, and throughout that time, uh, the, the program was rebuilt, and this year we had the best record in Ontario, and um, unfortunately we lost to Toronto one nothing in game three, uh, in golf. And again, it just, we, uh, we had chances and we just couldn't bury it and they did. And that was the end of the game. So, um, yeah, no, it, it was great. Now there's eight players graduating again. Um, uh, and six of them are, uh, are girls that I came in with. So I thought, you know, this is a good time for Scott to, uh, to step aside and let someone else come in and, and help that team. And, uh, Again, I, I really, really like the uh, the supervising, and I think that's more my speed. And uh, the one thing I, I can pass on to the officials is that we're only human. We all make mistakes, and, and there's been a couple games where there's, uh, you know, big mistakes, and I would go in and I'd use Ted Lasso's line, what's the animal of the shortest memory? A uh, goldfish. Because, you know, we all make mistakes, and, and these people would – be like upset and i say would it make you feel any better that i did the same mistake in the nhl but i did it in an nhl playoff game and they'd be like, really yeah so you just you can't let it uh, let it eat away at you just get on learn from it but and, and it probably won't happen again because you know we're talking about calling ices when your team short-handed or calling icing when it's a, a one player pass to the other player and he misses it and it goes all the way down the ice you don't know who passed it i, I did that in a playoff game so these things happen and uh you know, they, they, they kind of like that on positive and I, I defend them as much as I can or, uh, you know, coaches and GMs, they get upset and whatnot. And again, you know, I, I like to point out, uh, that there's one coach that was yelling at my son who's working lines about an icing. And I felt like saying to him after the game, uh, you know, did you yell at your captain when he had the, the, the puck on the, on the flank and he, instead of looking to see where he's passing, he passed it right to the other team and they had a two on one the other way. I don't think he yelled at him. So why are you yelling at, at my kid that, made a really good call it was a bad pass your your guy passed it nowhere near the guy and he he thought the defenseman for their team should have played it and then there's no way like you're you're locked in to play that guy getting the pot the puck in the past and if he doesn't you can't be superman and so anyway i i really enjoy I like getting out we're now into the junior b semifinals and uh league semifinals i should say and, and same as the junior c and the hockey's really improved and you know they, there's fans there and they're passionate there was uh I was at in Hesper the other day and New Hamburg was playing. There's three older gentlemen from New Hamburg and they just didn't, I like the officiating. I, I thought I was going to have to call 911 because they're all going to have heart attacks. But, uh, you know, they, the people get, they get a little wound up. I did have words with a, a fan that after the game decided to yell some profanities at the officials. And I went up and explained that I was with the OHA and I didn't really appreciate him yelling at my officials. And maybe he'd like to come down and say what he said to the, to them to their faces and one of them happened to be my son who's six foot five and 240 pounds and built like a brick uh whatever you would call it and uh, i said maybe you'd like to go down and say it to him face to face and the kid kind of looked at me and shook his head i go just remember that when you're when you're talking like there might be somebody around that's going to do something about it I, I just don't understand that hmm. always a peacekeeper scott <laughs> I don't think that you would call me a peacekeeper. Uh, I, I don't like my wife certainly wouldn't. I, I've toned it down a little bit. Uh, it's a, it's funny because I have my teaching degree. Uh, I went to a Western for my B.Ed. and got hired by the NHL. But during the lockouts, I, I taught high school. And in 2004, 2005, I ended up teaching uh, a big chunk of the year doing long-term occasionals. And my wife and I both, both agreed that after that uh, little stint that I probably shouldn't teach anymore because I wouldn't be able to afford, afford the lawyer in case I did something stupid, like <laughs> acted upon my urges to take a, a, a really wealthy teenager and teach them some lessons. But again, I digress. <laughs> well, Scott, it's great to have you out there with those young, those young guys trying to learn to be the officials they want to be, because it's really important to have someone of your status and your knowledge and your, your ability to, to, uh, help them because, uh, I'm on the rink. I've been on the rink like since I left the league pretty well, uh, quite a bit with supervising at all levels, and it's very important to have that type of leadership for those guys to learn. And when you're in the stands, Scott, you just have to kind of step back a little bit. Don't attack everybody. 
<laughs> work on the officials and make them better. It'll be so fine. What, what Lance <laughs> is talking about is I popped in. I had a real long day of officiating on Super Bowl Sunday. I went to watch my son work a junior C game just as a spectator. Then I went and supervised a junior B game. And then I went to watch Laurier play Nipissing in the playing game. And there was one father, and I just could not believe what he was yelling. And there was only about 14 people at the game. Yeah. And this guy is just teeing off on every call. And I thought maybe uh, I'd go for a little flyby and walk at him and give him my uh, the look that I used to give people on the ice when I was getting really upset. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I, I knew there was a supervisor there because supervisors usually sit in the corners. And this guy was right. And it turned out it was Lance. And I just said, Lance, I had to come down and look at this guy. Like, <laughs> it's just all I could do to go up and like throw him on the ice and just say, would you just zip it? And uh, Lance goes, yeah, I had to look at him too. So I said, was, oh, I said, I've already seen the guy and he's high behind that pillar over there. <laughs> like this guy was just losing. Oh, him. he was awful. I, I love it when the fans yell and they're wrong. Like even the players get all heated up and you know the rule, and then they'd say no, and then you say, "Okay, this is the rule." Oh, I didn't know that. Well, maybe you should read the rule book. So, I even I was supervising the other night, and I was explaining uh, a situation that happened in one of my first games where a team had pulled their goalie, and as their goalie was out, uh, the other team uh, kind of slashed the guy's stick with the puck on the puck with the net, and uh, the team thought that should have been a goal because there's no possession and control. And uh, I said, you know, I've stopped and I said to the GM, I go, no, any actions by your player that did something to the other team that, you know, and the, the stick hitting in the, his stick, that's an action and it's contact and that means no goal. So I was explaining to somebody and this guy beside me goes, no, you're wrong. And I'm like, I turned him and I go, excuse me. He goes, no, you're wrong. He goes, uh, he goes, that's a goal. There's no possession and control. I said, it's not a goal. And uh, it doesn't have to be possession and control. It just has to be uh, an action. And I go, in the NHL, it's actually... Uh, sorry, it's contact in the NHL. It's any action. So if I did a sweep check and missed you, and you still put in the net, that's considered an action. It's no goal. And I'm like, trust me, I know the rules. And the guy's like, well, I'm a referee too. I do some of the games up here. And I'm like, okay, well, I suggest you read the rule book, and because you're wrong, and I'm right. And and um, then I I gave him another rule, and he got it wrong. And I said, and I could tell the guy had been drinking. It was a Saturday night in Mount Forest, and I just kind of was going to say, hey, why don't you go home and read the rule book and catch up on things? Because so, I said, when we got a rule wrong, we were fined $1,000. He goes, yeah, but you guys made a lot of money. I go, it doesn't matter how much money you make. If you get a rule wrong, you get fined $1,000. That really, like, it it, it, it shouldn't pay what it's, it's your pride, too. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Scott, this has been great. Uh, it, this has been a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, congratulations on, you know, a great, career in the nhl but hockey all around i mean as a player as a as a as a, a coach and uh, now as a an official um you know congratulations on all you've done here in this game thanks randy appreciate it yeah thanks scott thanks a lot for coming on and i think that i look forward to running into you in the rinks and we'll keep working our well as so hard as we to can to make the referees better and and try to educate the fans if we get a chance. I'll let you do the educating the fans. I'll just stick to watching the referees. <laughs> well, Lance, uh, don't run into me because you you know you're going to end up on the short end of that stick. Yeah, you're a great guy. I know that. So, yeah, but we'll we'll definitely uh, see each other at some games. And uh, absolutely, it's always it's always nice to see Coach Jeff. Coach Jeff was my wife's basketball coach at Lori, and she still uh, speaks fondly of him. And uh, you know, I I did slip up there when I was talking about hockey, and I I brought up Lori instead of Guelph, but. Uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's funny going back and playing at that rake. Uh, I look up in the banner, and the eighty nine ninety uh, OEOE championship team was uh, the team that I was on. And even in the dress room, they have uh, the three pictures from the OEOE champions back in the eighties. And we played a, a, a morning game against uh, Laurier, and then after I the the players or the the boys must have been there, the men must have been playing practicing right after. So I went in the room and I just you know explained, hey, this is what I. I played on this team and now I'm a, I just retired from being an NHL linesman and they're always looking for people. And I kind of gave them a little tutorial of what you need to do. And, um, yeah, then they went on their little, uh, round in the playoffs. So then it's, a, it's always good. There's, there's lots of, uh, purple and gold at our house still coach Jack, but, uh, you know, every now and then, uh, well, I, I had to wear my golf stuff uh, for a fair bit. So um, it, it was good. I just really enjoyed the experience. Uh, Th thanks, Scott, so much for uh, for coming on and and uh, give my best really to to Colleen and and uh, I know that uh, deep down there's there's always going to be purple and gold and in, uh, in that household that's for sure. So 
thanks so much and and all the best yeah anytime guys uh this was fun and maybe next time randy can ask me more questions instead of lance <laughs> just kidding <laughs> just welcome kidding. Lance. hey scott welcome to my world on this show wow. <laughs> Holy moly. It's just, i'm just trying to get a word in once in a while I see you and I go to the same barber, so that's, <laughs> that's a good thing. But yeah, yeah anytime, guys, uh, anytime. And if you ever want to tour Normandy, I know a good tour guide. <laughs> that's great. Well, what I what I really do, I, I should have thrown this in earlier. I try to make uh, like a personal connection. The guys I took from Exeter last year, they uh, their father slash grandfather had fought, and while we were over there. Um, I learned that his best friend who we met in basic training was, uh, was killed. And I found out what regiment he was with. And we went to the cemetery and they were able to, to have a picture taken at their dad's best friend's grave. And then we went to the spot where he was killed. Cause I knew that he was part of, uh, uh, it's called the operation, uh, totalize in August 8th of 1944. And they were, uh, gentlemen that were the, the Canadian decided, the Canadians decided to break through the Germans line by doing a night attack in the columns of tanks and armored vehicles. And unfortunately the, the furthest left flank, they ended up at the wrong hill and they were called the Worthington force, uh, after the Colonel that was in charge of the armored division. And, uh, they were basically all killed. They were annihilated. They're surrounded by the 12th SS. So we went to there, there's a memorial to that. And it was just very emotional for those guys. And for myself, I found out that there was a paratrooper from Seaforth, Ontario that was killed on June night. So my last trip there, I went to the cemetery where he was buried and had my picture taken there. And, uh, you know, just, just really cool. And, you know, for, for your area, um, people don't know it, but, uh, there was a gentleman from Hespler, Ontario. His name was uh, Lieutenant Bill McCormick and he was a tank commander in the first Desires. And on D-Day, his tank cataract made it furthest inland than any other uh, Canadian unit. They actually made it to their, uh, uh their D-Day objective, which was called the Oak Line. And it was by Carpacate Airport. And, uh, Lieutenant McCormick and his crew and, and two other tanks turned around to go back and find infantry for support. And they said, no, we have to stay here. We're, we're consolidating for the, the time. We don't know where our British counterparts are on our flanks and, and whatnot. And Lieutenant McCormick was, uh, seriously injured, uh, on June 11th in the, a battle at Lane Manilk, the tree, and he lost a leg, but, uh, you know, guy from Hesper ended up furthest inland than, than anybody else on D-Day. And it's like, it's amazing. People don't know what stories. Mm. Well. Thank you for all you do to keep those memories and stories alive. No problem. It's great. As always, uh, please remember to like, follow, and comment uh, on the show. Uh, we uh, always appreciate hearing from you, and you can contact us at what do you know about sports at gmail.com. And uh, Scott Driscoll, thanks very much. Hopefully, we have you on again sometime. We'd love to do that. And uh, thanks again. Yeah, anytime. It's great, guys. And a reminder, guys, uh, our uh, our uh, Cracker Jack producer, uh, Cheryl, is uh, gone next week. She is down in Charleston doing some work, so we will not have a show next week. So we will see you again in the uh, first week of April. Take care. Bye.